Hey there, it's Mr. Hefner again, and this week we're going to take a look at two poems by Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman is probably one of America's top five most respected poets in history. The first poem we're going to take a look at is called uh, Song of Myself, but if you notice on the slide it says From Song of Myself. This is such a long poem, it was actually a lifetime work by Walt Whitman, that we're only going to be taking a look at an excerpt of it. The other one we're going to take a look at is O oh Captain, My Captain. And this is one of the most famous poems in all of American literature. And I've actually known several people over the course of my life who chose to memorize this poem and carry it with them wherever they go. Our lesson essential question for this small mini unit on Walt Whitman is going to be, how do these poems exhibit common themes of Whitman's works? Now, we're only taking a look at two poems, so I'm going to be filling you in on some other details as we go. What about this guy, Walt Whitman? Uh, most of the authors that we've looked at so far in this course, if you think about them, were well-educated. We've seen uh, several who were educated at Princeton, Harvard, Yale, all Ivy League. They tended to be uh, upper-middle-class people. And now we have Walt Whitman in this Civil War period, and uh, he was born the son of a farmer in Long Island, New York. He trained and worked much of his life as a carpenter, even while he was writing poetry. And he started out life as an independent pretty young. By the time he was only age 12, uh, he needed to leave school, got his first job in a newspaper print shop. That's kind of important. Uh, so many, so many writers uh, who didn't finish school spent time working in, in print shops of some kind. Charles Dickens did it. Uh, Benjamin Franklin did it long before that. Mark Twain did it. And here we have uh, Walt Whitman. I think this is the way they get their education through a, a hands-on uh, opportunity to work with accomplished and, and trained writers. By the time Walt Whitman was just 15 years old, he was completely independent, living on his own, working. Uh, he was essentially uh, an emancipated adult at 15. He did a lot of things over the course of his life. Uh, he was a publisher, published his own stuff, and sometimes uh, works from others. Uh, he was a school teacher for a while, which is pretty interesting considering he didn't have a formal education himself. And he had those uh, print shop skills. They really, you know, you could get a lot of jobs all around the country, uh, as we'll find later on when we study Mark Twain. Uh, that's a skill that you could take with you in those days. The interesting thing about his, his poetry is if you, if you read between the lines, he may, he's making a lot of commentary about society and government and the way we could make this place, America, in the mid to even late 19th century, a better place. During the Civil War, which is the period that we're studying right now, uh, he volunteered his time as a, a Civil War nurse. Now, he, he had no medical training. During the Civil War, uh, a nurse was pretty much anyone who volunteered to help, uh, to help uh, the, the wounded as they were recovering. It was a job that required a lot of compassion, uh, and it was a job that required somebody to be a, a very strong person because you saw suffering every single day, and, and death was always just waiting right around the corner. Now, his early poetry was, was criticized by a lot of other poets and writers of the time period. Uh, we've talked a little bit in class before about uh, this thing called free verse. Free verse is a type of poetry that doesn't have a predictable rhyme scheme. It may not have any rhyme scheme at all, and it does not have a, a fixed meter. And once again, it may not have any meter at all. And to many at the time, this was something new, and it didn't, to them, qualify as poetry. One of the interesting things about this was he had one fan who wrote reviews and, and praised him highly, and that was Ralph Waldo Emerson, one of the most respected writers of, of the day. And Emerson, a guy who believed in self-reliance and doing things your own way, really praised the style that Walt Whitman was pioneering. In 1873, Walt Whitman had a stroke. It didn't affect him mentally, but it, uh, it was physically debilitating, and he needed to settle down. And at that time, he moved to uh, Camden, New Jersey, just across the Delaware River from Philadelphia. And if you've ever been down to the sports complex, 
uh, Lincoln Financial Field, Citizens Bank Park, or the Wells Fargo Center, you, you've definitely seen uh, this bridge, which is known as the Walt Whitman Bridge. And you probably, if you've gone to the shore or something like that, the Jersey Shore, you've probably crossed the Walt Whitman Bridge at, at some point in your life as well. But it was named after Walt Whitman, who lived out his life in Camden as a way to honor him as a New Jersey citizen. Now, the first poem we're going to take a look at is called Song of Myself. And this is one of those poems that was a, a lifetime project for the author. He published it in his book, Leaves of Grass, which was his other lifetime project. He edited, re-edited, and, and re-released. Uh, this, this was a book that, over the years, grew with additional poems, then shrank down to just the core, and then grew again. But every time it was published, Whitman decided that Song of Myself would be the first poem in Leaves of Grass. And you might have noticed the, the, the grass on the background slides here. Grass plays an important symbolic role in Song of Myself. Now, this poem is, is unconventional, like we talked about. Uh, it's going to avoid rhyme. It's going to avoid a predictable meter. Sometimes there's meter, sometimes there, there's not. And uh, you're going to find some very long poetic lines and some very short ones. Some people have described the poem as being or organic in structure, like it's alive and growing, almost like a plant, and you don't know where the next shoot of the plant is going to go. And, and as I said, it was his lifelong work. He added to the poem. He changed it. This, uh, you know, this is a good example of that old writer's idea that a piece of writing is never finished. There just comes a point when it gets released. And whenever writers look back at works they thought they had completed, you know, months or years ago, uh, they always come up with ideas for what they would like to do next. This poem describes his own personality. And so you'll feel a lot of who this guy was. This was a guy who was uh, out all the time, walking the streets, watching people, talking to people, enjoying every aspect of, of life and, and seeing people at all levels of existence from those who would sweep the streets and streets needed a lot of sweeping in the days of horses uh, all the way to those uh, who ran businesses. And the other thing that he does, which is kind of interesting, is, you know, poetry up to this point was always looking for those magical, impressive, lofty subjects in the world and, and turning them into poetry. And in the case of Walt Whitman, he takes the average, everyday things, even lowly type uh, things, and he turns them into poetry. The second poem that we're going to take a look at from Walt Whitman is O oh, Captain, My Captain. And it's one of two elegies that the author wrote to honor Abraham Lincoln after his assassination. If you've ever seen the movie Dead Poets Society with Robin Williams, you know that O oh, Captain, My Captain figures prominently at that film. And by the way, if you haven't seen that film, you've got to see that film. Uh, this was published uh, for the first time in 1865 in Drum Taps which was a, uh, a magazine of poetry uh, in the years of the Civil War. And then it was later published in, in Leaves of Grass in both the 1867 and the 1871 edition. And in both editions, it was the first poem in the Book of Poetry. Like I said, it's one of two elegies in memory of Abraham Lincoln. An elegy is a lofty, highly structured poem that pays honor to a, a person who has died. And, and the fact that it is highly structured is going to make it really different for uh, Walt Whitman. Walt Whitman is a guy who pioneered the free verse, but you're going to find in this one that there is a clear rhyme scheme. There is a, a very restrictive meter to the poem. And the language that he chooses, the diction, is very formal. It's not a relaxed kind of organic type thing like Leaves of Grass is. Now, the literary tools that we're going to be taking a look at uh, as we read these two poems uh, are, are pretty numerous. Uh, the first one we've talked about, it's an elegy. It's, it's that simple. When you read, O Captain, My Captain, you'll have read an elegy. It's a poem that pays tribute, uh, laments, shows sadness for the loss of, of some person. Uh, the next one is going to be rhyme and various versions of rhyme, like rhyme scheme and meter. We've talked about these a number of times, but we're going to pay attention to uh, this mostly when it comes to O Captain, My Captain, because that's the poem that has a set meter 
and has a set rhyme. You also know uh, symbol and symbolism when something uh, stands for something else. So you have something very concrete, but it often represents something that might be much more abstract. And then there's elaboration. So elaboration, which is also known as amplification, some people use the word amplification, some people like elaboration, uh, is a writing technique that, it's, it's a form of emphasis, but it takes something simple and then it holds it up to the reader and examines it and re-examines it by using uh, various different techniques to give the reader an idea uh, of what this thing is. All right, now this is the point in the video where you're going to stop. You're going to pause the video right here so that you can come back to it. Don't close your window. Go read the poems. And when you have the poems finished, come back here and we'll go over the reading check questions. So you go ahead. I'll wait right here. All right, you're back. So let's take a look at these reading check questions. First one is, who first asks the question, what is the grass? Yeah, that's a child. Child are often the most inquisitive people there are. And in this case, Walt Whitman in, uh, in the poem is, is using a child to show that there's a curiosity asking questions that we don't always understand. How does the speaker say that he's like the spotted hawk? Yeah, he's loud and untamed. This is a poem about going out there and living life. And loud and untamed are two good words to describe the speaker in this poem. Where should people look for the speaker after his death? Think about this one. This is a question we've had a few times before. Yes, they should look for him in the grass. Because what is the grass? The grass is the speaker. We die. We're buried. The physical part of our, our bodies decomposes, becomes part of the soil. The grass grows. This is a very scientific poem. But we literally go on forever. It's that idea of the law of conservation of mass. All right, let's take a look at some true or false questions then. True or false, Song of Myself is written in free verse. That is absolutely true. It is about as free verse as you could get. There's no rhyming, there's no set meter. Number two, in Song of Myself, Walt Whitman asks his listeners forgiveness. And that, of course, is false. Even if you haven't read the poem and you've just been listening to this presentation, you can kind of gather that the speaker in this presentation, this, the speaker in this poem who is loud and untamed, isn't going to be the kind of person who asks forgiveness for anyone. He's proud of who he is. Number three, Song of Myself is an example of romantic poetry. Absolutely true. This is, this is a poem about the ideals of living and making the most of life, and there's nothing more romantic about that. All right, let's take a, a, a look at some of the literary terms and how we might use them here. Number one, the pattern of sounds at the ends of lines of poetry in a stanza determines... That's right, determines the rhyme scheme. Rhyme is not always at the end of the line. Sometimes you can have internal rhyme. We had that with Edgar Allan Poe. But in this case, the, it, the sentence says at the end of the line. So we'll just go with it. Number two, a point by point representation of one thing as if it were another. Yeah, that's an extended metaphor. So We've talked about similes and metaphors, and you've talked about similes and metaphors in every literature class you've ever had. You know that similes are a comparison that uses like, and a metaphor is a stronger version of the same thing that just simply omits the like. But in an extended metaphor, we kind of do it more than once with several examples. How about number three? Blank invites a reader to associate the thing being described with something quite different from it. 
Yeah, that's going to be a simile. Could it be an extended metaphor? Sure, it could be, but we've already used that one, so I would take either answer here. Number four, the rhythmical pattern of a poem comprises its what? It's meter. It's the rhythm. Just like in a song, you, you might have a 3-4 song or a 2-4 song. You have a, a, a meter uh, indicated at the beginning of every piece of written music. You can hear that in the poem as well. In fact, I think we talked about this earlier in the year. Uh, the ancient word song meant the same thing as our poem today. Songs didn't have to have a melody. They just had to have meter. And the last question. A poem that is written to honor someone who has become lost is known as an elegy. All right, that's it. We're all finished with Walt Whitman. We're going to move on soon. You might have uh, some other assignments you need to do, so take a look in Schoology. Uh, thanks for paying attention to this presentation. This was Mr. Hefner, and I'll see you later.